I'd like to welcome now Ann Chow. She is the CEO of AT&T Business, which is a $37 billion business within AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us today, Anne. And, uh, you know, I wanted to start off with the fact that, that we share something, both immigrant kids and both who played piano from a very early age. And you talk about how that kind of has shaped the way you approach business in some ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Bertha, thanks so much for having me here. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you here in front of our esteemed um, audience. Yeah, that's, it's kind of cool, isn't it? You know, I think no doubt part of our immigrant stories are around how our parents came, you know, to seek a better life, right, for their families. And part of that for me was, in, in my family, was wanting to immerse us in, uh, you know, very unique experiences that we could not have had perhaps back in their home country. And one of them was, was music. You know, I look back on it, and I don't know about you, Bertha, but there was a time when I was younger that I actually wanted to, you know, to be a professional musician. And, you wow. know, I had visions of Carnegie Hall and all these <laughs> kinds of dreams. And fortunately, you know, reality struck in. And, you know, at some point I realized that I was pretty good, but I was not great. And it was not really my passion. Performing really wasn't my passion, although I love music for sure. So I think it's really set a great foundation um, in terms of leadership um, and in business. You know, as as pian you know, as a fellow pianist, um, you know, you know that uh, first of all, practice is everything, right? Practice it is. is perfect, right? And you know, this discipline that we all have to have as leaders, no matter what our profession is, you know, you've got to keep trying, and you've got to keep trying, trying, trying over again, right? And when you fail, whether you fail in a performance, right, um, or you fail in your practice, the key thing is that you you get up and you keep at it, right? And that is how you hone your craft. That is how you hone your, um, you know, your art and your skills. And I think those lessons very much port very well um, into business today. It's just as, as one example. Clearly very skilled at being able to create that metaphor that, that inspires. You know, it's interesting for me, part of the reason I stopped was because I realized I had to make a choice between dedicating so much time to practicing by myself versus doing activities where I could participate in things with other people. And as I got towards high school, I realized that was more important for me and more important for my development. For you, it seems as though you, you have always been about very much participating with people. You were one of the uh, founding members of the AT&T University gov governing board to help train other people, also helping with AT&T's International Women of Color uh, Affinity Group. Is, does that come from that immigrant experience, you know, coming from Taiwan and thinking, I'm an outsider, I want to bring other people into? Yeah, no, no question. And, and, and Bertha, I, I'm sure you can relate to this as well, right? You know, as coming from an immigrant family, I think one of the things that I have quite frankly struggled with all of my life, both personally and professionally, is this whole idea of fitting in, right? Mm. You know, I, I grew up with a generational gap, a cultural gap, a language gap with my parents, you know, and as a result, with their constant push of wanting to assimilate um, it was obvious we were one of the only minority families in the community I grew up in, um, in the East Coast in the time. And I just never really fit, right? Because fundamentally, I looked very different than everybody, everybody else, yeah. right? And so this was this constant struggle. And I found that one way uh, with which to engage with others successfully was to take on leadership roles, right? Because by, by definition, you have this ability and this opportunity to engage with others. And I found the same thing, you know, for me, the pivot point of steering away from music, um, and as a pianist, you're very much individual, right? It's an individual sport, if you will. Um, but I, I found that in order for myself to grow and to surround myself with people, I naturally gravitated to more team sports, if you will, and team activities. And I push myself to take on roles that fundamentally, because a lot of people now who know me um, don't, don't think this is actually true, but I was very introverted and hmm. very shy throughout 
uh, most of uh, most of my childhood, even into young adulthood, right? And so this skill of becoming more of an ambivert, um, you know, it, it has been a developed one. It's been one that isn't inherently in me, but I really forced myself to do that because it, for me in the beginning, it was about trying to fit in. Now, of course, fast forward decades, um, I, I realize now that part of my part of my magic was actually and is actually my differences, right? And is is my authenticity and what I bring to the table that's uniquely different than others. But that was certainly uh, one of uh, the revelations that I wish I had early on in my career. Yeah, it does take time. I, and, you know, it, it's interesting that at, you're at a point where you're a person of leadership, you have actually been a person who's very much talked about needing to be authentic, needing to be inclusive, and talking about the issues of bias in, in the corporate culture. And it seems as though this past year, all of a sudden, that wasn't just, oh, that's nice, and it's something you do over here. Now this is center stage, and we're seeing not just, you know, people of color talking about it, but people at the very top of the C-suite over the last year suddenly saying, wow, we really have to take this seriously and not just sort of check the box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so true. You know, it's, um, I think it's a unique organization um, and I'm not, I'm not just even talking about the for-profit or the, or the private sector world, but whether you're in the, in the public sector or in a nonprofit or otherwise, or even in a community environment, educational environment, um, you know, there are, I, th I think one of our big awakenings over this past year has been this idea of systemic issues, mm -hmm. right? You know, diversity, equity, inclusion, I think has always been this topic that feels a little uncomfortable, right? Because it feels very personal. And I think it takes a very brave and courageous organization to embrace it as a strategic imperative. You know, I, I happen to be very fortunate that my career has largely been spent in an organization that does embrace the diversity, equity, inclusion in the fabric of our strategy. Um, and so that was a big part of what helped me thrive along the way. Of course, I worked hard for it, um, did uh, you know, many of the right things, um, surrounded myself with many of the right people, but you've got to have that environment, right? And I think that what, um, what the year we've just gone through and the point in time we are today, you know, we sit at the nexus of numerous crises, right? We've all, we've all talked about them over this past year, the pandemic, the recession, uh, this awakening around systemic racism and social injustice, right? That is just so ingrained in so many facets of our society. Um, and therefore we know that it permeates business, right? We know that it permeates the corporate environment. The question now we have as leaders is how do we get at it, right? How do we get at it in a way that is constructive, that is transparent, um, that is honest, that is on authentic, but that is biased towards action and change, as opposed to, let's say, you know, in the old days, you know, one of the sayings that we used to have is, you know, it's easy to count the numbers. It's much more difficult to make the numbers count, hmm. right? And now it's, it's, we've moved well beyond this, right? This is about elevating the whole of organizations, which means that you not just have to focus on your teams or your culture um, or the organization at large, you have to focus in a way on every individual, right? And I do believe that one of the things that has occurred that is very, very positive, um, there, there are actually several positives out of this, this past uh, year and, and the time we find ourselves in, is just this recognition and realization that connection is everything. Hmm. We are here for human connection, right? And I, I you know, I, I've said this before in various um, uh, speeches that I've given and, and conversations I've had. I wish that we coined the phrase um, physical distancing, not social distancing at the very beginning of the pandemic, because we need to be physically distant right now until we tackle the enemy that is this virus, but we need social connection more than ever before, right? Hmm. And I That's true. do think that this awakening around diversity, equity, and inclusion is this now um, almost ubiquitous acknowledgement of the power of connection and the power of human connection, which therefore must mean that we embrace the whole person in a way, right? And that is, I think, one of the many reasons why the time is now, quite frankly. 
as a leader, a corporate leader in your company, how do you maintain connection? How have you been able to do that over the last year with, you know, people that you're trying to mentor and just your staff overall? You know, we all get such Zoom fatigue. Oh my gosh, yes. It's 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 a topic that I, um, I'm, I'm going to write about this um, very, very soon because we're coming up on a year, right? We're coming up yeah. on a year of this mode of operation, if you will, right? So um, the, the whole idea of connection, I mean, it's it's in the early days, I would say, right? We, we almost found somewhat joy in this ability to be on video, you know, dressed from the waist up and not from the waist down, right? You know, well, and you know, um, and for introverts, in some ways, it's a, a little better by my, my... Yes. My brother was saying his son who's a bit of an introvert has actually done better yes. doing re remote school because he doesn't have to deal with all of the other sort of, you know, the anxiety of, of being in the halls and, you know, and, and all of that. He feels like he's in a safe place. Oh, it's, it's, it's so true. It's so true how different people have processed this new mode of operation, right? But what I would say is now because we're so long into it, right, is that we're all reaching what you just called Zoom fatigue, right? We're, we're all reaching a burnout of sorts. Um, you know, I, I wrote this piece actually on LinkedIn and it was called a couple of months ago called like, no more meetings, right? Everything, <laughs> yeah. part, of, part of the problem we have now is we have to schedule. Well, hey, let's schedule a Zoom. Let's schedule a Teams. Let's schedule a WebEx, right? So if I wanted to, you know, back in the day, I just like call you, text you, ping you, swing by your office, right? You know, go yeah. out and visit you in your in your in your local you know city or whatnot, right? And it would feel much more organic and authentic and not staged, right? So somehow we have to recapture that, right? What what I have done, and I have switched it up over this past year. You know, in the in the beginning, I will admit, especially in the heat of the crisis, it was all this, right? It was all these you know, heavy video interactions where well, I lost, honestly, I lost track of what day it was, what, you know, what, uh, what day of the week it was, what time it was in the day even. Um, and so now I try to mix it up in terms of my mode of communication and my mode of connection. You know, um, I, I'm very purposeful about which sessions, which gatherings I choose to engage on video versus where those maybe audio is fine, right? Uh, because of my role in the conversation. I try to block out something that I've established for myself is water cooler Wednesday. So I'll block out a period of time on my calendar. I have, I don't allow myself any meetings. And all I do is I, um, you know, I impromptu serendipitously reach out to people via text or otherwise, you know, Hey, can you chat? Hey, you know, just kind of a health check, you know, um, uh, you know, mental health check or, you know, project check in a much more informal way, right. In a much more informal way. Um, and then in addition to this, because I do feel that, especially in times of stress and Bertha, my gosh, we yeah. are in massive time of stress, both personally and professionally now. Um, I believe that having the right level of over communication is really important. And so since the pandemic started, I actually send a weekly note to my ent entire organization. And quite frankly, if 99% of my team doesn't read it, I don't care, right? If it helps <laughs> one person in my organization, feel connected to the broader mission of the organization to what's going on you know because i can't physically go out into the field and travel the world and be with them in market um I, this is very important to me and i do the same with my clients as well you know ad hoc now has a beauty to it that um we we weren't really respectful of before right we really took it for granted mm -hmm. you know um and so that is part of what i've tried to infuse um, in my uh, daily routine to shake it up because it is just, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not natural, right? We as humans were not designed to interact in this way, right? I miss the handshake, I miss the <laughs> hug, right? I, I miss physical presence with each, you know, with, with, uh, with people. And so those are just some of the, the things that I've done to try to, you know, sustain, retain and grow connection, if you will. What about the mentoring piece? Yeah. Was that something that was important for you coming up? I mean, you've been with at and now for more than 30 years. And, and I read that initially you were kind of rebuffed. It was sort of like, oh, you're, you know, yeah, you've got a business degree. Yeah, you've got, you know, science background, but you're not ready for sales. You're not ready for customer facing. Yes. Uh, how, did, how did you get past those hurdles? And how did you find that connection for people to see who you really are? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I would tell you this, this, you know, I'll harken back to my immigrant and my diverse roots, if you will, right, and my identity of who I am. Um, the, the upbringing that I had, and when I reflect back on my parents' journey, you know, I think about grit and resilience, right? And I think about their challenges and their struggles and coming to this country with almost nothing. And there's nothing that I face that will be greater challenge than what they face, right? And so that sits with me, that's in my DNA, it's in my persona. But a part of that DNA also is being in service to others and also recognizing the importance of people and community around you. I would say mentorship plays a really vital role in anybody's career. Um, and perhaps one of my lenses on mentorship is a little bit different than others, which is I don't believe it can be forced, right? I don't believe mentorship can be kind of cold called, if you will, right? I'm still shocked to this day when a complete stranger will reach out to me and say, hey, will you be my mentor, right? And it's almost like- What saying, do you say hey, when they do? <laughs> I, I, I say, well, hey, you know, I'm open to a conversation. Let's get to know each other first, right? Because a mentor is a, a mentor relationship is a two-way street, right? It's got to work for both parties. So- um, you know, it's a mistake that I see some people making is, hey, they assume that, hey, I'm, I'm an Asian woman. And so therefore, if another Asian woman reach out, reaches out, that's enough to sustain, you know, to create a mentoring relationship. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, right? Um, and so I think this is something that I would advise people to, to really be considerate about is, you know, mentoring um, is great, but it can also be um, uh, it can be overly forced, in which case it's not genuine, right? Yeah. So I also think that there's also two types of mentoring. One is um, a sustained, where you establish a relationship with somebody um, over a sustained period of time, right? And I've had those relationships throughout my career, both as mentee as well as mentor. But I also feel that what is missed at times is the opportunity for an episodic mentor, right? So a situational mentor where at this point in time in my life, in my career, I really need help and perspective from this kind of person. So I'll, I'll give one example. Um, I heavily stressed uh, about the decision to have children and be vocal in, like, hmm. and to come out in the workplace and say this, right? Um, you know, this, this, uh, the, this, this book that I recently co-authored about unconscious bias, there's a story that it opens up from our, our primary author about perceptions of pregnant women in the workplace, right? And I mm. will tell you that um, the first time I uh, was pregnant with my first daughter, I hit it. I hit it really? for a month. I hit it for as long as I physically could possibly hide it. Um, and the reason why is I was concerned that there would be bias. I didn't know that that was the word, by the way, at the time, right? But I was concerned that it would impact my ability to compete for a promotion, which was at that point in my career, right? right? And so the what way I, you would be perceived was that you were not committed because right. you had a family. Whereas if a man has a family, that is considered a commitment because it shows that he's stable. Right, right, right. Or, or, even, or, or even worse, right? Even worse she actually physically has to go out and have the baby, which means <laughs> that she will not be working for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Right. Gosh, who knows how long, right? Because we're, you don't know until after right. you have your child, right? You know, God willing, right? And um, worse yet, I would be taken out of the running because of the physiological nature of actually having to give birth to the child and have, them have a leap, right? Just the and timing. So, yes, right, the timing of it, right? The timing of it, nobody, Nobody wants to go hire a critical position and then be left with not the candidate there, right? I mean, I would admit that I would have that kind of view too, right? Um, and this was, uh, this was back, um, you know, in the late 90s. And so, you know, what I needed at the time was a situational mentor, right? I needed a mentor who had gone through that to walk me through that situation, right? And then after I became a mom, um, there was a period of time where the struggle of you know, uh, and I hate the word balance, but, you know, sort of the integration of my personal life and my professional life was such a challenge in the early days for me. And it, and it, and it was quite frankly, all throughout. It's just, I think one of the, uh, one of the challenges um, and quite frankly, taxes that women bear, right? And we see right. it today, even in terms of the impact of the pandemic, don't we? That yeah. more women are checking out of the workplace. Why is that? It's because there are so many systemic issues that place additional pressure and burden on the women and their role in the families, right? And the pressure that they, and burden they put on themselves, right? <laughs> very, I mean, very, I, very, 
Right. Uh, not to digress too far, but I, I there was a piece in the New York Times where this woman, she's Latina, and there were side by side pictures, or it was one picture actually of her in the bathroom on a conference call, changing her her little one who is potty training, and then her husband on his computer in the other room. Yeah. And then she said, you know, I feel kind of resentful because sometimes he'll just sit there and take a nap and, you know, he's too busy to take care of her daughter. And I'm thinking, why what? do you let him do that? You got, you've got to rearrange your contract and your relationship first, not just yes. your job. Yes. And so much of it, uh, and Bertha, thank you for bringing this up because this is something that I've actually found very um, a kindred spirits in my Latina colleagues, right? Because there are very, you know, there are similarities between the Asian culture um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Latina, you know, Latina, Hispanic culture in terms of how we view ourselves and the role in the family, right? I mean, there, and there is also a fundamental, gosh, I've, I've worked how to break it at different times in my career, but like, I, I, I have this natural innate feeling to def be deferent, you know, be in deference mm. to others, right? And I, I, it's just in me, you know, I don't like speaking up unless I really feel like I have something really impactful to say, right? I, I have this, um, you know, perhaps at times over rotated respect for kind of hierarchy and, and, you know, and elders, if you will. And that's all ingrained in me, right, from yeah. my cultural upbringing. And sometimes those things don't, I mean, they hamper you, right? They hamper you um, in, the, in the work environment professionally. And it's something that I think we've got to learn how to surface. And so your, your, you know, your original question around mentorship these are areas where having the right mentor can mean the world. You know, I, I look back on some of those uh, early mentors when I first became a mom, and I reflect back on some of that being the best advice possible that has shaped my leadership approach, you know, to others that has really just widened my sort of leadership aperture on how I really work to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion um, as a leader in every facet of the culture that I strive to, you know, to, to build and grow. And where do you go now? I mean, now that you're at the top, I would imagine there are just lots of people looking up to you for advice, looking up to you, but where do you go? Yeah, so, so for me, um, you know, uh, and, and I love how you said 30 plus ish years. Um, and it, it's something that, you know, I, I've actually been told not to say it because I perhaps don't look that old, maybe. I don't know. It, it's, it's that Asian skin, right? It but, is. Um, hey, go but, with it. Um, yeah, yeah, I will. I will, right? I will for sure. But where, where I go from here, and, and this was probably a crossover that I started to make, quite frankly. Um, in my mid 40s, right? And then now that I'm in my 50s, probably, um, this for me, where do I go now? I am now all about impact, right? I'm all about, you know, being the change. I'm all about paying it forward. And so where I go, and, and this is really largely how I've spent not only just doing my day job, of course, over the last you know, 15 ish years, um, but I'm very heavily focused on ensuring that the legacy that I leave, whether it's in a client relationship, whether it's a, in a process that I, you know, that I leave the engineering of, re-engineering of, whether it's in um, workforce development or out in our broader communities, that I'm really striving to drive systemic change in addition to doing my day job incredibly well, right? Um, and so, you know, examples of this, uh, you know, some of the work that I'm so proud of, um, that uh, that my company has embraced that I, I quite frankly was a big catalyst in you know we uh, we started um, an employee network uh, AT&T Women of Business uh, you know a couple of years ago maybe it was about five years ago and it was because we didn't have a women's network focused on the business part of our organization um, it is now um, you know it for the early years was one of the fastest growing women's networks it was not just populated by the way membership was not just women um, you know we had almost 5,000 members all around the globe and we tackled topics you know and brought certain topics to to life that were not previously tackled, such as the importance of, of male allies, right, mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, you know, in your success as a, as a woman in business. Um, another one was how to be an intentional ally for multicultural women, women of color, because of their own unique uh, needs and the struggles um, that they face in the work in workplace. You know, perhaps one of the, um, you know, most uh, proud initiatives um, that we've launched 
um, was uh, also a women of color initiative across at and And I will tell you, I was a little bit like a dog on a bone on this one. I was pushing, pushing, pushing Deborah, really? a very dedicated initiative on women of color because I saw what was happening uh, you know, across corporate America, which was women were making progress, but women of color were being left behind, right? Mm -hmm. And then the McKinsey Lean In report came in, uh, you know, started being published, I think it was the first one was 2016, that actually had data behind that, right? Around women is that women in the workplace annual uh, set of research that they do across hundreds of companies. And there was now data that said, if an organization focuses only on women, women of color will be left behind, hmm. right? And so I utilize that as a catalyst um, to compel, and by the way, it was not hugely difficult once we had that data to create a women of color initiative within at and which focuses on um, each program consists of about 200 women, but plus their supervisors. So it is not oh, just about developing and growing um, uh, the, the women in a color. sense it's also developing the supervisors to be able to recognize right someone who looks different from them but the same qualities in that person exactly right because allyship and advocacy um you know goes even beyond mentorship right in order to be successful to have true equity and representation in all facets of of the business world you need advocacy right you need sponsorship you know, um, you know, we've all we've all seen and read the studies of, hey, current course and speed, you know, we, women will achieve equity in what, 75 years? <laughs> that's too, that's too dang long. Right. And then for women of color, it's going to be even worse. But, you know, mind you, we all know the stats. Right. By the year 2060, women of color will be the majority of women in the yeah. United States. Right. And so we deserve a seat at the table. We deserve and we you know, we've got to figure out ways to accelerate, right? Accelerate what should have been. And Bertha, this is quite simply, so where I go from here, right? This, this is what I'm spending, um, you know, much of my time on in addition to my day job. And this this really also was the impetus to join the book project um, to, to co-author that book on unconscious bias, because that is a way to enable um, and support systemic change um, in a positive, constructive way that goes beyond you know, the day job uh, you know, uh, influence and impact that I can have as well. You know, it's interesting because people talk a lot about sort of the tax of being the other, the tax of being the black person and have to explain to someone that, no, I'm more nervous than you when I get stopped by the police you know, about driving while black or, you know, uh, I'm Latina and, you know, I walk into the room and they might think that I'm the cleaning lady instead of the, the woman who is the, the professional who is walking in. Does it ever get to the point where you sort of feel like, at some point, can I just stop having to advocate so that it's just normal? Or do you think this is something we're just always going to have to do? Well, um, here, here's the thing. Um, we all, uh, we, we all have biases, right? And the, the biases in the system have been built up over decades and centuries of history, right? Um, it is embedded in our policies, it is embedded in uh, cultures, right? It is, you know, of organizations. Uh, it is embedded in various, right? Each geography has unique cultures, right? That is based on their history, if you will. And so, um, while we always have to advocate, I would argue, yes, why? Because there will always be the underserved, the underrepresented, um, there, and you know, it may not be the same group of people as we have today, but there will always be, to some degree, um, you know, injustices because, and, and this is a, a fundamental belief system I have, unconscious bias is part of the human condition, right? Mm. And so while we may tackle this particular bias today, by simply moving forward, we will develop new ones, right? And we've got to develop the muscle to be able to have candid conversations, courageous conversations, um, uncomfortable conversations, to listen, to understand, to empathize, to engage, so that we can develop and execute action for good, right? For, for true progress. So, you know what, is it exhausting? Yeah, it's totally exhausting, right? It's totally exhausting, you know, and I, and I, and I can't, you know, I can't tell you how many times even today, I'm still the only, right? I mean, it's probably 
more frequent that I'm the only, whether it's the only woman, uh, yes. the only minority, or certainly the only woman of color. That happens all the time still, right? You know, in the room, whether it's in a client discussion, supplier discussion, team meeting, or otherwise, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I certainly strive, um, strive to uh, not be the only, right? You know, and I may have been the first, but I certainly don't want to be the last. And so much of my personal mission, which melds into my professional role, is ensuring that uh, there are more, right? There are more, that there is not just this, this, this only feeling, um, but we have, to, we have to be there to support each other. You know? And here's, here's a little safety tip, because I wanna use the example that you just used with, um, you know, if you're a Latina and you're in a room, somebody assumes you're the cleaning person. One of the, um, one of the and, I, and I cannot tell you, Bertha, how many times I've been in a meeting throughout the course of my multi-decade career where somebody asks me to take the notes or close the door, <laughs> or get the coffee, okay? So here's a safety tip. I don't ever do that now, right? I don't. Even if I'm the closest- So you don't ever ask someone to do it either. Right, right, or I'll, I'll ask not the female, right? You know, um, so I will not volunteer to take the notes, even though there I get pressure in sessions because I take great notes. Hey, right? So <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm say, oh, sure you're fantastic at it. <laughs> yeah, but what happens when you take the notes? If you take the notes, you're focusing on taking the notes and not fully engaging in the conversation, right? So, um, so there are little tips like that that I have, that I have had to embrace for myself because I don't want to feed that stereotype, right? And I don't want to disadvantage myself or others who, who, who look like me or have some of the same struggles because it's, the nat it's almost like the natural default, right? And, and yeah. many people who are asking us to take the notes or to close the door or whatever, don't realize that there's kind of like this double entendre in there, right? About it, right? Or the signal that it sends, you know, that somehow you are lesser than in terms of truly belonging, right? And um, it's in, ter in terms of the signals sent this year, I mean, you know, my company, your company, they've all said we're putting our money where our mouth is, we're going to invest, we're going to do this. Do you think this is just a moment in time? Because certainly we've seen these kind of, let's take the great leap forward moments, right? When women were first brought in the workforce, you know, when we were coming up and we saw that right. first opportunity. Right. Is this something that is going to be sustainable and more ingrained this time around? Or, you know, are we just going to keep going from moment to moment? Um, I believe it will. I believe it will. And I believe it has to. Um, why do I feel so strongly and so confidently about that is um, one, it's pervasive, right? It's, it's pervasive now, right? It's not just one sector, right? We're not just talking about um, women in tech or Latinas in media or, you know, or, uh, you know, Asian hate crimes, right? It, it, there's a convergence, right? There's a convergence of, of imperative, right? In almost every facet of society, right? And there's been, um, I, I think, a, um, uh, you know, a, a surge, very much welcome so, of quantitative data and research and facts which complement what we who have been in the underserved communities or minority communities have always kind of intuitively known, right? And um, look, the, the, there, there are allies and advocates who are clearly emerging, right? And there have to be, right? Who are not um, you know, of a particular minority group, right? I mean, we need the white community. We need all diverse communities to lean in and work this together, right? And, and this is what I think is so powerful about organizations like, um, you know, like HACER is this is all about being better together, right? I mean, this is what this, this conference is about. And so I also feel that one of the reasons why I feel so confidently that this is not just the moment in time, that this is about true sustainable change is our children will demand it, right? Mm -hmm. Every generation that comes forth, and I am a proud old Gen Xer, right? <laughs> but Gen Y and Gen Z, every generation is increasingly more diverse, okay? So if we are to advance society, if we are to advance the economy, if we are to advance um, you know, equity, you know, education, healthcare, you know, income equality, if we are to advance 
you know, um, environmentally, right? I mean, we, you know, we, we haven't even talked about the, you know, sustainability uh, needs of this one planet, which we all, you know, live on, right? If we are to in impact and drive sustainable change, we must be in a fundamentally different place and keep advancing diversity, equity, inclusion in every facet of our life, right? The younger generation will demand it, right? They will demand it because by definition, uh, they are, every generation will become more diverse than the others, right? And, I, and I, I look forward to the day where we're not even just talking about one aspect of someone's identity, right? I, this is one of the things, this intersectionality, if you will, right? Yeah. Um, you know, right? I, I can be a China Latina, right? I can be, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know my, my children, I happen to be married to um, a, a, a white uh, gentleman. So my, my kids, by definition, are multiracial, multi multicultural, right? three out of four of their grandparents are immigrants, right? And so on my husband's side, you know, his mom is a Hungarian immigrant, right? And so, you know, I, I, see, I see it and I, I think oftentimes, and this, this is actually one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about championing our women of color initiative at AT&T was, I saw great strength in, you know, the black sisterhood. I saw great strength in the Latina sisterhood, right? I was part of the Asian sisterhood but I didn't see us coming together, right? Mm. And I saw that we had so many of the same barriers and struggle, um, you know, and uh, difficulties, right? And learnings that we would be better together and we would be stronger together. And I can tell you in the early days when, um, you know, I kind of conducted a couple of focus groups of, um, you know, a, an intersection of women of color, it was like, it was like therapy. It was like a, a cathartic moment because we found each other and realized that we, we could drive incredible change together and that, that actually our community, our posse, if you will, was even greater and bigger than we thought it was, that it was, right? And so I'm uh, really- Just really a nice thing to find out. Yes. Well, let's leave it on that note. We can keep talking for quite a while here. So much to discuss and it's been such a pleasure uh, hearing your thoughts and your journey. Uh, I really appreciate having the chance to speak with you and hope we can continue to uh, have this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you again, Bertha. Thank you. Thank you.